So, cool. so today we have Dan Ko from the Space Telescope to talk to us about JWST results, which is going to be super exciting. Um, Dan did his undergrad at Cornell and uh, his PhD at Johns Hopkins and uh, has done a couple of projects, JPL, Space Telescope, and landed there for and JWST. So can you tell us more? Yeah, thank you so much. Far with ours. Yeah, can we dim the lights a little bit to see some of these beautiful images? Yeah. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, thanks so much. And, uh, yeah. Thanks again for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, and you're doing a, a ton of this great science that's coming out of Texas. And, uh, um, yeah, it's been a while since I've been here. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so, yeah, I work at Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. Um, so, it's, and I'm Kind of like faculty. I have half my time for, for astronomy, all this fun stuff. That's uh, that's worth it. Yeah, I um I spend the other half of my time. I, I don't teach, but I uh, I support the community, other astronomers using Hubble and now JVST. Uh, so I basically spend all my time working on these, these observatories. And uh, yeah, so I'm part of the NearCam team. And uh, so, you know, the main camera Hubble that took this image here that I'll, I'll talk about that uh, amongst many other things. Um, so I mentioned there's been a ton of papers, um, over a hundred I've, I've counted. I've put, uh, I put together a, a, a library on ADS. Um, so if you go to this link, um, this is actually a wiki that I've created. So anybody can go on there and, and add stuff. My idea is for the community to, you know, add things there. Uh, it's just been me so far, but I'm going to, Keep talking about it and uh, see if it takes off. Um, so high z dot space, uh, and then I have uh, uh, JWST papers on there. Um, and ADS does this thing where it tries to, to group them into different categories. And uh, so if you click on one of these, you'll see, um, well, you can see the different words that come up that are used often. Um, and if you click on one of these, you'll see the papers that are in that area. It's kind of a neat tool and it seems to you know work well enough. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they've covered a bunch of different topics and I'll, I'll try to highlight a few here. I certainly haven't read all of them. Um, I don't know if I've read any of them I've covered more, but I've, I've skimmed a few and I'll, uh, I'll show you a few of the highlights, um, but I'm, I'm gonna leave a lot out, um, including maybe stuff that some of you work or other people have done. Um, so forgive me. But um, some of the things I'll be talking about is, um, well, gravitational lensing um, is something I, I've worked on a lot. Um, and so you combine the power of JVST plus gravitational lensing. Now we're seeing the smallest structures we've ever been able to see. Um, so really tiny um, star clusters, just you know, parsecs across. So the size of star forming regions within our own galaxy, we're now seeing in the distant universe and we're able to, to learn all these things about them. Um, we've even discovered an individual star in the distant universe I'll tell you about, um, and a bunch of other stuff. But uh, why don't I dive in, which is a, a lot to show. So um, the Sears program is, is run out of Austin. So Steve Finkelstein uh, um, has run this one of these large programs, and they have these these beautiful images that you you, you might have seen. Um, yeah, a little bit dark, but here's the you know these beautiful color images. And then if you zoom in, you see some of the highlights of these galaxies. Um, so you know, just off the bat, really you know, fun to look at, interesting things, um, and including some of the most distant galaxies known. Um, so this is a galaxy that Steve named after his daughter, Maisie. Um, so Maisie's galaxy is at a, a redshift of 12, um, which is more distant than anything we could ever see with Hubble. Um, and, I'll, I'll, and that's um, less than 400 million years after the Big Bang. So the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Um, so we're really, you know, we're looking at the first 3% of cosmic history. Um, we've never been able to see what anything looked like in that time. Um, and now we're seeing galaxies um, and this is just one of them. There, there's a bunch. There's like, you know, tens of galaxies that are super distant we haven't seen before. Um, so this is a little taste of, of what we're seeing with, with JWST. You might have seen these other beautiful images come out. Uh, so this is from, this is from the, uh, the press release, uh, the, the ERO, the early release observations. Well, this is the Hubble image of this. And I'm going to flip back and forth and then show you the JWST. Um, so this is where stars are born. Um, and these are the cosmic cliffs um, up in the Carina Nebula. Um, one of my favorite, uh, you know, is, uh, is, is in the Carina Nebula. Um, and you see so much more detail with GWST. Um, you see where stars are born, you see where stars die, and they, they spread their materials um, out into the rest of the cosmos. Um, you know, this is where we come from. You know, we're all made of star stuff. 
um, and with JWST, we're learning, um, you know, how that star stuff was made in the early universe. Um, this one is a bit closer to home, and we see a lot more detail um, in this expanding show um, from this exploded star. Um, and then we, we see galaxies. Um, we see here again with Hubble, and then if you, you look with JWST, and you see a lot more detail um, in these you know, sort of fiery trails um, and these, these merging galaxies here. And then we go to a galaxy cluster. This is actually um, one that uh, I observed as part of my Relics uh, Hubble Country program. Um, and this is the this is the Hubble image. Um, then you look with uh, with JWST, and there's just you know so much more that pops out. Um, this was Webb's first deep field, um, and a lot of people were surprised it would be a galaxy cluster. Um, they thought you might do a sort of blank field. Um, we actually get one for free off to the side. Um, but when you combine JWST plus lensing, um, you're able to see so much more. Um, I'll, I'll zoom in a bit. Um, I mean. Well, I, I was fortunate. I got to be part of this um, early release program, and uh, you know, so it, it just you know blew my mind when I saw this stuff, and I was bursting to, to tell everyone about it. Uh, I mean, you see all these little dots around the image. Um, these are probably little globular clusters that are part of this uh, this galaxy cluster associated with these galaxies. Um, there's a faint galaxy like this uh, that we could just never see before with, with Hubble or with anything else because it's it's such a low surface brightness. Um, but you see it with, with JWST plus lensing, you know, it, it pops out and, you know, so there's, maybe we didn't know the galaxies like this existed, you know, um, and we can, we can see them now. Um, and then my favorite galaxy of these was, uh, was this one down here. Um, and I zoom in on this. Um, and this is where I got this idea for, um, for cosmic spring, I, I call it. And this even made it into the press release um, that, you know, there are these tiny buds of star formation um, that appear to usher in cosmic spring nine billion years ago, um, and it and whereas you know in the in the nearby universe you see galaxies that are more like these spirals and ellipticals you know things that we're used to um, they kind of look like these dandelions which um, by the way I didn't I didn't know that these were the same flower uh, until kind of recently but, uh, <laughs> you know but actually this this yellow one sort of evolves into this this white one as it, as it gets older and you know galaxies do a very similar thing this uh, this spiral galaxy can can get old and, and jump old and turn more into this like puffy ball, this, this elliptical. Um, but in the early universe, we're seeing, you know, galaxies that look like this with all these little tiny buds of newly formed stars, I thought. Um, but it turns out this was wrong um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we don't need a cosmic spring. We already have cosmic dawn. We have cosmic noon, cosmic happy hour, I've heard. Um, you know, we don't need, what, what does cosmic spring even mean? That's okay, let's, let's forget about that. And also, um, Turns out maybe these aren't young after all. So the first paper that came out analyzing this, that you know, this really cool galaxy that uh, that I love, um, said actually, well, these these clumps are really old, um, and so they named this galaxy the Sparkler. Um, and but they said, you know, these are like three, four billion years old. These clumps, and they're actually like um, globular clusters already, with precursors to globular clusters, it's really old star clusters. Um, and they, they formed in the first billion years of the universe. Uh, so they're these bound you know, clusters that have survived a long time. So much for cosmic spring. And then another paper came along. So wait a minute, actually, they are relatively young in the cosmic sense. These are like maybe 10 to 100 million years old, which is you know, fairly young in terms of the age of the universe. And they're compatible, compatible with some recent merger event and these clumps have kind of been ejected. Um, and so, um, and, and so this paper, they actually analyzed a bunch of galaxies in this first um, field. Um, and so this is the result they got. And so what I did is I invited them together and I said, let's all, you know, let's sort this out. And let's, you know, so now we're working together and we're trying to figure out, um, you know, the differences. And these are all nice people and we're having these telecoms and we're, we're working on this. Um, and one of the things that, you know, we, we gathered all the, the photometry, so all the, the brightness estimates of these different wavelengths. Um, and so, and this is a lot of what I do is this um, spectral energy distribution fitting, we call it SED fitting, where we take um, the brightness in these different filters of these different wavelengths, in these different images, and we try to fit a spectrum to it. Um, and so one fit is that, yes, it's, it's an old galaxy, um, about 3 billion years old, um, and that fits well. Oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> Or it could be a, a young galaxy um, that's you know a lot younger, uh, but with a lot of dust that makes it better. 
Um, and so if you if you flip back and forth, I mean, you, you can't really tell these apart. Um, so we, we looked at this with, you know, there's six different wavelengths and they just did just look similar. So that's that's one idea that I've, I've had so far um, is to, you know, maybe we just, you know, we aren't sure which it is. Um, and it's, it's hard to tell actually, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. We have some others that are a little bit more clear. Um, was that a voice? Was that Casey? Yeah, that was the voice of someone yeah. from, you know, from the ether. Um, yeah. is, that, is that the explanation between these two? I actually wondered about that. I'm glad you're talking about it. Yeah. Is, is this sort of the explanation is the old kind of age dust degeneracy but for yeah. individual star clusters now? Maybe. So we've just started working on this. Um, okay. and so they're also, you know, updating the photometry and, you know, trying to figure things out a little bit better. Um, and yeah, we, we don't have an answer just yet. We're, we're still working on it. This is all you know, preliminary stuff. And um, yeah, but but maybe this this was something I put forward. But um, yeah, there yeah we'll we'll see. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah. Um, so so you know to be continued. Um, so I, I'm going to keep using Cosmic Spring. Also, I'm, I'm just going to use that for my team name now. So you might see it sprinkled uh, throughout here. Um, so that was that was the first interesting thing. And. Um, so to zoom out for a minute, um, what we're doing here is, is gravitational lensing of these galaxies. Um, and I'll show you some more results here. This is actually, this is the one other galaxy that um, Jane Rigby um, reminded me of when I said, I've never seen a galaxy like that one. She said, well, there's this one other one that kind of looks like that. Um, also gravitationally lensed um, and has these, these clumps. Um, so th this is the image of this galaxy. And this is what the, the lens modeling tells us that it looks like if you account for all this lensing. Um, and by the way, this is what it would look like without lens. So this is this is a Hubble image. So this is Hubble plus the lensing. And if it weren't for the lensing, uh, you just wouldn't see any of the little structures, any of these little star clusters. Um, even with JWST, you know, it, the powerful JWST it would still just see this kind of you know, it's a galaxy here. Um, so uh, yeah, JWST plus lensing is amazing. And, um, and it, it looks similar, although the, the clumps aren't as, you know, separated from the galaxy as that other one. So I still think the sparkler is, is unique. Um, so here's, uh, this is my uh, program. Um, so this is a, a JWST program um, observing this, uh, this galaxy cluster here. Um, and like I said, uh, the near cam actually has two cameras on it. Um, so we get this a relatively blank field over here for free. So we have this galaxy cluster that's lensing these distant galaxies that I'll show you in a minute. And then we also have this sort of blank field over here. I made all my data public. Um, it's available if you go to cosmicspring.github.io. Uh, we, we've also been tweeting it. Uh, we have a Cosmic Spring uh, you know, Twitter. And um, yeah, so it's all available. Oh, and I have a, a large team. I've, I've accreted now like 75 people because I keep uh, you know, just, just talk to me. You're, you're welcome to, to work on this with us. Um, and uh, I'm mentoring a number of, of students and, and postdocs now, uh, including my um, uh, Brian Welch was my grad student at Johns Hopkins. He's got, he made the discoveries I'm about to show here, and he's now since uh, graduated and he's at NASA Goddard with uh, Dean Rigby, which uh, people here uh, also work on, uh, Justin and Grace. Um, so um, this is um, the, the galaxy that we, um, we we set about looking at with JVST. Um, so it's um, it's kind of simple, it's similar to the sparkler. Um, it has these little clumps, um, but this galaxy is much more distant. This galaxy is at redshift six, observed in the first billion years of the universe. This is the most highly magnified galaxy known in the first billion years. And we found it with my large Hubble program relics. And, and we got JVST time for it. Um, Oh, one other thing, by the way, it's, um, it's got these little clumps, and it also has an individual star here um, called Arendelle, that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so, so that made some news a little while ago, um, was this, uh, this uh, discovery um, that, that Brian made. Um, but the, other, the main reason we were interested in this galaxy uh, in the first place was these little clumps and how much we could learn in the early universe um, about these little star clusters. Um, and they, they stand out. Um, if, if you look at um, other clumps uh, that have been observed, um, these are a lot smaller in radius. Um, here's the, the sunrise arc clumps down here. So we're able to see smaller structures than a lot of these other ones at, at all different redshifts. Um, and there, there's a couple other interesting galaxies here too that we 
proposed for, we didn't get time to do the next one. But um, so here's the here's the sunrise arc. Um, there's all these clumps on it that Brian identified, um, and we're going to get spectra of all of these with near spec um, in in December or January. Um, and and this is what the galaxy looks like if you um, if you take account for the lensing. Um, and so there's these little clumps. And so this is a galaxy in the first billion years. Most of the time you see a galaxy that's distant, you just see like a little fuzzy blob. Um, you don't see any details. And now we're seeing all these little clumps. And so we're gonna be able to measure things like, um, you know, does this galaxy have a core that's older, like galaxies near us? Um, does it have higher metallicity? So more of the you know, uh, elements in the, in the core? Um, or is it more kind of inside out, like a scene where a lot of galaxies at, uh, well, Redshift 2 or so. Um, anyway, we're gonna learn a lot of stuff um, in detail about this galaxy. Is that not real? No, sorry, this is a, a simulate, this is part of our proposal. This is a simulated spectrum. Um, yeah, we're not gonna get this until, uh, I think it's December for this program. Um, but yeah, but it, we'll probably get something kind of like this um, using the prism. Um, so yeah, we're gonna cover this whole wavelength range. Um, but for now, we have the imaging. And already with the imaging, I mean, there's so many times when JWST has just sort of at, at, like blown us away and outperformed our, our expectations, um, which were already really great. So already with the imaging, we're starting to get ideas of like how intense this emission is uh, of these these different um, these different emission lines. So if I go back, I mean, there's um, there's H alpha, um, which tells us about the star formation rate, and then there's oxygen three, um, which tells us um, I don't know, you could probably tell us. I mean, it tells us how intense of a star former it is, and uh, you know it needs to have a certain metallicity for the oxygen there. And, uh, uh, whatever, whatever it's. Just gas properties in general. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I'm still learning spectroscopy, um, but you can already see this in the imaging um, because it's the emission is so intense um, that it just lights up. Um, so there's these these things called green pea galaxies that amateur astronomers actually discovered in the Sloan survey. And they were just kind of looking at images, and there were some galaxies that showed a bright green because they had intense emission at a certain wavelength, um, and it showed up green in these images. But we're seeing a similar sort of thing in these images. Certain wavelength, um, what is it? Yeah, the F uh, three fifty six uh, filter, so at three and a half microns. We're seeing these just light up um, with this intense emission that shows that these parts of the galaxies are really young, like a few million years old, with really intense star formation even before we take the spectrum. And we'll take the spectrum and we'll probably confirm it and learn a lot more. Uh, but um, yeah, and it's, it's only in these parts, um, whereas these other parts, um, right, okay, so here's, yeah, here's to actually illustrate what I'm saying, um, is that if we do this SED fitting that I was talking about, here's the photometry, and you just see at this wavelength, it's so much brighter. And that's where you see these, these parts that are lighting up green over here. Um, and yeah, you see these lines of how intense that is. And then if you look at these other parts, um, these are a bit older. Um, so these are, uh, what did I say? Well, I'll, I'll actually, I'll show it in a minute. Uh, but these, you don't see quite the intense emission there. So these, these blue points are sort of a little flatter um, and sort of more, um, a little more modest in their emission. Um, and, uh, wait, do I have, oh, wait, where's, oh, I thought I had another, I had another slide on that. Um, I was going to show that basically these are, um, let's see, yeah, um, yeah, these are a few million years and these are a few tens of millions of years old. And um, yeah, so it's kind of similar to the, to the sparkler, but, these, it, but it's, um, I think it's less ambiguous in this case. We don't have this degeneracy where some of them might be a few billion years old. Um, you know, these, these were fairly confident in, at least with our, you know, with what we've done so far. Maybe somebody else will come out with a paper saying they're a few billion years old. But, uh, um, but this is only in the first billion years, so uh, there's less we want to work with. Um, all right, so um, yeah, let's um, let's move on. There's, I mean, if there's any questions, feel free to stop me in for uh, But there's, there's there's so much that we've been learning. It's it's exciting. Um, this is the the star um, Arendelle that was uh, that was lens. So that this is an individual star. Um, uh, Brian. Uh, Welch discovered this galaxy, had a nature paper on it, and he named it after a character from the Cimmerillion, uh, Arendelle. Um, the, the, it also means morning light in the Old English, uh, so that, that worked for me. And um, yeah, this is basically what uh, JWST was designed to do. 
was to study the first stars. Um, we thought that would mean you know, stars within galaxies or uh, you know maybe supernovae. If we're lucky. But we discovered this individual star in the first billion years that we can look at with JWST. Now there, there have been other stars that have been uh, discovered, individual stars, and it's remarkable because you know again you, you normally see a galaxy like this this distance. It's um, you know just a, a blob. You don't see the details. Um, there have been a couple other stars at redshift one. Um, so about you know half the age of the universe, um, and these are also lens. Um, most of these um, kind of flickered in and out because um, there was micro lensing that temporarily made them brighter. But ours, uh, well, the you know Brian's uh, Arendelle star, it's been constant for over five years now. This is actually an old slide. We have more of it. It, it just keeps going, and also with JWST. Um, so we're able to study it in detail. Um, and Right, this is um, a little bit of detail about, so it's, it's right on this thing we call the lensing critical curve, um, which means it has super high magnification. Uh, with lensing, you typically get magnifications of a few um, or maybe 10 or so if you're lucky. In this case, it's magnified by factors of thousands. And that's how you see an individual star. Um, it's also a fairly bright star. Um, and these have gone up now. So if, you, if anybody's you know, keeping score at home, um, it used to be a few thousand, and now it's you know probably more like ten thousand, depending on which lens model you look at. And um, right, so there it is. Oh yeah, and just to say, I, I keep saying an individual star. We've always known it would probably be more than one star. It's a very massive star, um, and they they rarely alone. Um, and so people who know about these things tell me it's probably a binary, or maybe three or four or six stars actually, and they're all kind of here. But we've been talking about one star. Um, can I have a question? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you showed like sizes of star clusters. If you oh uh, yeah, yeah. You say you say like it's not a star cluster. Like how do you? I guess I got it. It's like a two part question. Why is yeah, it? Yeah. Why is it not a star cluster? And part two is so how, how do you actually measure the sizes of the clusters? How do you estimate that number? Yeah, yeah. Great. Like question. the lens model. Um, yeah. Did I? Do I have that slide in here? I think I, I maybe took that slide out, but. Um, yeah, I mean, you do the lens modeling, you know, similar to what I showed before. Um, and this thing is, um, it's less, its radius is less than um, a few tenths of a parsec uh, with Hubble. Um, and then with, with JWST, it's like a few hundredths of a parsec. Um, it's, you know, so it, a star cluster would be bigger. As so you can the, actually like spatially, you spatially resolve the star clusters. You know. Well, yeah, sorry, yeah, the, oh, the, well, so the star clusters aren't as magnified. So we also don't resolve those. But so this one is just, it's such a high magnitude. they're spread because the light is spread out or like what? Um, well, so yeah, so none of these, I mean, where's a good image? Um, <laughs> let's go back. Yeah, so these things, so none of these, none of these are spatially resolved. I mean, the, the galaxy is resolved, but each of these individual clumps, um, they, they just look like a, a point source. Okay. Um, so these are magnified by a factor of a few tens. And this one is magnified by a factor of thousands. And so, so that when you de-lens that and the size of those things, these are uh, a few parsecs, as I showed before. Um, but this one is like you know a lot less than a parsec. So, so that's the size comes from the lens model. Yeah, yeah. And so that yeah, that means it can't be a star cluster. And then when you when you demagnify the, the star, your your star, whatever, whatever you call it, yeah. that 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 just projects down to like something much smaller than a yeah. star cluster. Yeah, yeah. I normally explain that, and I was trying to kind of. No, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll show you in a minute. Just the brightness kind of works and makes sense too. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's actually so already with the imaging. We didn't expect this either. We already see hints of more than one star just from the light. Um, so this is uh, again the, the we have in this case eight filters. And these are the, the black points here. Um, and now we see that, I mean, you can kind of fit it with one star. This is a, a B star around 15,000 Kelvin. Um, but it's, it's a better fit by two stars, one of which is really hot, so an O star around 30,000 Kelvin. Um, and then a B star, which gets you this, uh, this part over here. Um, so I don't know, that was, that was pretty cool. I mean, we're, we're not too certain about that. And we're going to you know, get spectra and uh, you know, um, figure that out better. But, you know, we're already seeing hints that when we talk about Arendelle, we need to start figuring out, okay, there's, there's multiple stars here. Um, and what does that mean? And, you know, what, what do we hope to learn from this? Um, 
I'm not really a stars expert, but uh, you know, so here's one of the things we did. With, uh, so this is from the Hubble paper, from, from Brian's paper. Um, these are stellar tracks. Um, people who work on stars tell me, look, we don't even understand stars and you're trying to figure out whole galaxies. You know, we're still trying to figure this out, you know, especially for really massive stars like Arendelle. Um, and th there aren't that many stars that are massive and also low metallicity, uh, not, not super enriched. We don't know if Arendelle is low metallicity, but it's in the early universe, that might be. Um, so this might be a rare opportunity to study a, a really massive low metallicity star. And we had to go all the way out to you know, 13 billion light years away to, to, to see one like that. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna test these models. So these are models of, um, so this is an HR diagram, and this is the main sequence over here. I actually had to remind myself a lot of this. I pulled up this figure. Um, and then stars evolve off of that as they finish burning their, their uh, hydrogen uh, giant branches. Um, and so we're going to see where we see Arendelle on this HR diagram. And we, we, you know, all we can tell from Hubble is it's pretty massive, uh, pretty luminous. And then with JWST, we have something like this. So we, we've constrained that there's, you know, if there's one star, it probably sits about here. Um, and if there's two stars, there's probably an O star and a B star, um, and they're around here and here. Um, and then, you know, we have to look on here. Are there stars where that makes sense? I mean, you know, the O star could be on the main sequence, but the other one wouldn't be. It would be some, you know, evolved, you know, giant star. Um, and uh, yeah, is that, you know, is that even expected? You know, we expect to see two stars like that. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, um, I don't know. Kind of interesting thing that we're, uh, we're trying to figure out here. So, you know, I mean, the first step is to understand stars, and then, and then we can understand galaxies. Hopefully. So, uh, yeah. Oh, and, and then just to say, they, these stellar tracks are uncertain. Um, there's a bunch of different ways they can grow, depending on uh, metallicity, and then also who's creating these theoretical models. Um, and so we're going to see, you know, which of these, you know, fits best um, at the end of the day. Yeah. And then we're also going to get more data on this in cycle two. And um, yeah. or uh, spectra, there's a lot of things we can learn about the stellar winds and different things. Um, that uh, if you ask any questions, I won't really know the answer because it's not really um, so I'll move on to something else or maybe I can know a little bit more. And oh yeah, and this is to say that um, we're gonna get uh, spectroscopy. Um, so you know if it's a, if it's a hot star, if it's a cold star, I, I thought we would have to wait for this to, to tell whether it was hot or cold or the temperature. Um, but you know, we'll be able to see what it is um, in temperature. We'll also be able to confirm that it's a star, by the way, um, you know, in, in more detail. Um, because uh, well, it's a bit it's a bit subtle, but we, you know, if it were a galaxy clump, we would you know expect to see these emission lines. And um, yeah, it would be different if it was a star. Um, and this leads me to spectroscopy. Because you know, so far I've been talking about the imaging, and, and that's amazing, but um the, you know, as, as transformational as it is to get the imaging, the spectroscopy is you know, leaps and bounds above what we could do, um, you know, well, from the ground or with Hubble. Um, Sorry, actually, I, I'm trying to think. Yeah, later. yeah, please. Uh, I'm trying to think, but I can't think in real time. So uh, what is the, uh, like, what does a star cluster look like on the, on the spectrum? So, uh, yeah, it would be this orange one. So it would be, a, it would be what you're calling galaxy clump. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. So, so like when you say star cluster, like why I'm, I'm like going to like galactic cluster, but you, but you're thinking more like like galaxy, you know, or like when you when you say when you when you when you say this this lens emits or star yeah. cluster. Right? So. Well, I guess a globular cluster implies that it's old, and if it's a more like a young massive cluster, I, I don't know, or a star forming cluster, it's like is that yeah, like, yeah, or it could be a bit older, I guess, in between. But yeah, I guess I mean, uh, yeah, star cluster, it's more like an Orion than a okay. cluster. Yeah, and, and so I said, you know, there, there's a star system where the stars are orbiting each other. You have a binary or more, you know, say probably less than say 10. And then a star cluster would be like, you know, hundreds of stars they're not orbiting each other so much as they're kind of orbiting. And there would be gas associated with these things or something like that, the, the star clusters. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's where you get the gas. Yeah, and it's also, yeah, and that's where my thing gets a little funny. I, you can get emission lines also from the star, but they do different. This comes from the photoionization of the gas in the ISM, you know, in, in the galaxy. But um, yeah, it'll get a bit subtle there. Um, 
Well, while we're on the subject, I guess I was I'm curious. The I was struck. I, I saw Brian's paper and I was you know struck that it looks like a binary. It could be. How do you differentiate those different models? Like if it is a, a hot star or a cooled star, you know, spectroscopically, they look like they should be the same in your spec. That'll be hard, I feel like. Oh, uh, yeah, this, from this plot here. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, so the, the really hot stars, let's see. Um, well, this is 60,000 K, that seems really hot. And then you got 40,000 K. So these are, these kind of track down here. Um, I mean, you can sort of differentiate them, um, but- Yeah, I guess- you know, I would think the photometry is already kind of giving you that information. So I was wondering if there's something else. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know enough about the atmospheres of, of giant stars. I didn't know if there was some way you could resolve the single giant star versus a binary situation um, as well from the spectrum. And so I was trying to uh, judge the color here. And I don't know if you have any opinion about that. Like, could you differentiate hot star plus, you know, uh, binary or just giant star that we don't understand because the, the photospheres of a 2% solar blue giant is different than what we've ever seen before. Um, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, you, you're gonna have to tell me. And I, mean, I, you know, I have other people who know about stars on the team. And yeah, I mean, now that I'm looking at this, you know, everything we, we wrote in the proposal kind of assumed that there was sort of one star that was dominating the light. Um, but if there's, if there's two, you know, and, and if, it was, if it was a multiple star system, maybe the other stars are a lot fainter. Um, but, you know, if there's two stars that are about as bright and contributing to the spectrum, then you say, well, wait a minute, how do we, do we have a hot star plus a cool star, like how does that, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's basically this, this break here. Um, yeah, you know, right. I guess I would love it, I'm sure you would too, if you could actually get the spectral type, right, or spectral types, um, yeah. that would be an outstanding yeah. outcome, I just don't know how to do that, so anyway. Yeah, I mean, right, we, you know, we, uh, if we didn't expect to do this in the imaging and, and now in the spectroscopy, uh, I don't know, there'll probably be more surprises and we'll have to figure it out as we go. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's going to be interesting. You know, we might learn more than we thought from this. Uh, that's sort of been the theme so far. So, yeah. That's for why the magnification has not changed over oh, five years? Yes, that I can answer. So, um, yeah, we, we were surprised by that. Uh, at first, and uh, that, was, that was sort of the first question. And the fact is being on that lensing critical curve means that the, the micro lensing, um, so, I mean, the idea is that you have uh, in the galaxy cluster, there are these stars that are going along every once in a while, they'll, or fairly often, they'll pass in front of the star and make it a little bit brighter or faint. Um, being right on the lensing critical curve, you sort of have all of that just, you know, magnified so much that um, it, it always stays really, uh, really brightly magnified. Um, and I don't know if that, that made sense the way I explained it, but yeah. you know, we did the simulations and- uh, well, I'm also just surprised because like even the background star is proper motion. So if you're talking about a magnification of 10,000, I can't you know, think about like what the angular size, what the physical size at region of six that corresponds to, like what region of sky is magnified more than 10,000, it seems like. Yeah, I guess, I mean, Justin, it's a great question. I, you guys are the experts on that, but I was thinking the same thing, right? Because the fact, if it's lens by a factor of 10,000, because the surface area is preserved. So that means basically in the X and the Y direction, is it each a square root of 10,000? Is that the way I would think about that? So a factor of 100 in angular resolution in each direction? Uh, it's more going to be like a factor of 10,000 in one direction, a factor of one in the other ah, direction. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So if the proper motion is, stretched out that big long along arc. the perpendicular to the caustic then you would get yeah, you know super high angular resolution but if the proper motion is along it then yeah you would never see it right is that a naive way to think about it no i mean it's true okay yeah i mean yeah that we were also thinking that in terms of the yeah in terms of the micro lensing if you break right, especially the lens and, yeah you know and it, it could be moving to the source plane yeah, it, it could be moving in that direction or it could be moving perpendicular. And so, you know, we have a sort of range of, you know, likelihoods of, you know, when might we expect it to vary by a certain amount of brightness. And, uh, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's um, it's not varied that much. Uh, it's, it's all I can say so far. Um, you know, there, there might be some constraints we could put on dark matter particles. If, it, if we had, you know, infinitely good data. But, uh, now you're here to unleash. Oh, I'm not, I'm not touching that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I just, well, <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's plenty of other stuff. I mean, uh, and yeah, I, I, I wanted to, to talk about the, uh, this is all great questions, but let's get into the spectroscopy a little bit. Um, it's, it's something I also don't know very much about, but um, you know, there's, uh, there's smart people like, uh, you know, Steve Finkelstein, Taylor Hutchison has, uh, you know, done a, a ton of great work on this. And, um, you know, um, and, and Rebecca Larson and, you know, and it's like, um, it's like, Kind of you know, bleed a stone or something. You got all of these, uh, you know, all this time on Keck, and then you're, you know, you're working on the data, you know, as hard as you can. And uh, you know, she, she, she did this amazing work. And you know, I, I watched her uh, thesis, Taylor's thesis defense from AAS because they were, you know, at the same time, unfortunately. Um, and and I was glad I did because, um, you know, she, she has all this amazing work, including this discovery um, of uh, of these really faint lines um, that people have been finding in distant galaxies. Um, so this is. Um, you know, when uh, you can't normally see Lyman alpha, well, it, they do see it in this galaxy. And then she's also seen, um, uh, she's detected carbon four and carbon three, uh, all in the same galaxy at, at this distance. Um, and, and you can see, I mean, these are the detections, you know, they're, they're there, they're super faint. And she had to do a ton of work uh, to, you know, uh, to make sure everything was, you know, calibrated right on CAG and just, you know, get every last bit of, of the signal out of the data. And this is at a redshift of, of seven and a half. Um, so what is that? I don't know, seven, eight hundred million years after the Big Bang. And uh, right, and it's it's going to get a lot better with, with JBST. Um, and you know, you, you try to think how much better can it get. Right? This is what we get. This is in the very first data that came out in July twelfth. Um, and all of a sudden, now this is a galaxy even more distant. This is a redshift eight and a half. And now we see what's that, ten emission lines. And you know, it just, it just comes out. I mean, you know, so so things are, are getting a lot easier, and and you're learning a lot more about these galaxies. Um, and I think it's the I think it's like the most distant neon in the galaxy. Um, not to mention these you know these, these hydrogen and oxygen lines. Um, you can learn so much about these galaxies. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, so this is just phenomenal. I mean, this blew us away. I I was in Stockholm at a meeting when this came out, and you know, people just kind of you know, gasped. It. I was, I was scared up a little bit. It's just you know, it's so exciting that we're going to get all this amazing data for all these galaxies. Um, and, and things like metallicity, you can measure directly with the ratio of these oxygen lines. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, beautiful. And, and these, so this came out as part of the ERO test release. This is a bunch of uh, distant galaxies at different distances. And you can see these lines just you know, marked across and redshift um, you know, with the expansion of the universe to being redshifted to different longer wavelengths. Um, and we see something similar in our data, again, just with the imaging. Um, so this is a galaxy, um, this is from Larry Bradley's uh, paper in prep uh, on our, our data. Um, so this is a galaxy at redshift 8.8. .8. Um, so, so similar to this, this galaxy down here, we see these really bright lines. Um, and you can see it just in the photometry. So here we are at four and a half microns. Uh, this blue point is, is really high up at, up at the end there. Um, and it's you know, suggesting that we have really intense emission in this galaxy. Now, the question is, are all galaxies like this in their universe? Right? This, is the, this is another really important question. Or are some of them you know, a little more modest? Here's another galaxy. We have a, a similar uh, redshift estimate. Um, you know, none of these are confirmed. They're all, they're all candidates, but uh, we're fairly confident. Um, and this one's a little more modest. We don't see such strong uh, emission lines in that one. Um, as I say, this is all done with uh, Gabe Bramer's easy SED fitting code. Um, has, all of this is public, by the way. So all these catalogs out publicly. Uh, and I have public notebooks that can help you make nice plots like this. All objects. Here are those two uh, uh, galaxies again. Here's the one with the intense emission on the left. Here's the one with the little more modest on the right. Um, now I've used bagpipes, um, SED fitting. So. Uh, a little bit more detailed uh, uh, spectral modeling. Um, and I, let's see if I click through all these, there they go. Um, so the, yeah, the one on the left um, we think is, is probably very young, uh, just a few million years old, really intense emission. Um, so this is the, the O3 line plus H beta, uh, a few thousand angstroms equivalent width, meaning it's really strong. Um, whereas this other galaxy is a bit older. So, you know, it's fairly young, you know, 40 million years, give or take. Um, with a little bit more modest emission, maybe a few hundred angstroms. Um, so you know, there's a there's a, a variety of these, um, and um, there was a paper that did this in Seer. Um, 
um, like they played the same game. Um, this is by Brian Emsley et al. Um, and they found that, uh, yeah, you know, there were some that were sort of this three, you know, 40 million years, like I was talking about. There were some that were, you know, really young. Um, and there were, there were some that were even older. Uh, so maybe, uh, you know, half a billion years. These are all galaxies in the first billion years of the universe, um, we think. Uh, you know, not confirmed yet, but um, yeah, so there, there's a range. And they're starting to, you know, have statistics. They, they looked at over 100 galaxies. And they, you know, 20% of this old, 30% of this young, and, you know, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it, the next is to confirm all of this with, with near spec, you know, get spec of these things and see if this is right. But, um, you know, this, this is the whole game. This is how the universe works. You know, galaxies form stars and they build up a mass. Uh, and we're now able to actually see uh, working and like, measure these things. Um, and, oh, and then, you know, another interesting thing, they found that some galaxies are really young, um, but they don't have this intense emission. Um, and so that's weird. And you say, well, if they're, if they're really young, but they don't have this intense oxygen-3, um, then maybe they're just super low metallicity. They just don't have a lot of oxygen. This hasn't been formed yet in the early history. Take for granted, it was around in the beginning. It was just hydrogen and helium. It took a while for all that oxygen to build up. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, but, I mean, you know, this is a bit speculative, right? We haven't measured metallicity for these galaxies, you know, this is not, I mean, you know, they were far from it, but, um, you know, we'll go, we'll go after these with near spec or somebody will, and, you know, just measure the actual metallicity, which we've seen we can do directly with these, uh, these oxygen quantities. Um, and yeah, another caveat to things is that, um, we may have only seen the most active galaxies of mission three of the 10, uh, or, you know, uh, around there. Um, so this uh, paper led by, uh, by Charlotte Mason, um, where she shows, um, this is, these are simulated galaxies. Um, and, and her idea, I, I wrote a lot of words here. because it's, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point that, that she made. Um, within, the, you know, within the first, you know, 500 million years, that only the youngest galaxies or the most active galaxies have been detected. So what she's plotting here um, are, let's see, this, this dash line here is basically the detection limit of a lot of the JWST imaging so far, um, down to like 29th magnitude. Um, and this is a redshift 10. And so what you can see here is these, these points are all like blue or purple. So they're, they're fairly young, just a few million years old. You really need to go to fainter magnitudes, with, so deeper imaging with JWST. Um, to get down to like 30th magnitude, where you start seeing this whole you know diversity of galaxies, um, then you get the ones that are you know uh, tens or you know hundreds of millions of years old. Um, so this you know this population that um, at redshift uh, at redshift six or so you could see it, but at redshift ten she argues you know you, you would you would miss these older galaxies. They just wouldn't be bright. Enough. Um, so yeah. You know, there's, the point is that you know we're just, just scratching the surface in these first few months of, of JWST. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, then there's a, a, a more distant galaxies, um, and I think we have what 15 minutes. Or, or, okay, great, thanks. Um, so I, I know I've, I've, tried, I've tried to cover a lot of ground, and you know, uh, forgive me if it's a bit scattered. But uh, if you go out to the highest distances, um, now we're getting into the you know. The first um, 400 million years of cosmic time, uh, when um, we haven't seen a, a single thing, uh, what it looked like. Um, well, actually, these are the most distant things uh, that had been known. So at, uh, at you know, 400 million years after the Big Bang, and then even a bit earlier. Um, so these two are with Hubble. Um, this is one that I discovered. This one is Pascal Oge. And then this is uh, uh, Harakane down here, um, which it's 11 and 12 and 13. Um, these are all going to be observed with JVST. Um, my program is going in, uh, well, it, it could be next week, it could be in a month or two. Uh, all public data again, so you can have a look. In your spec in January. Um, and what are we going to do with this, uh, with this pale red dot? Well, we're going to see what the, what the spectrum is, um, and we're going to see um, is, it, is it young or old? Um, some galaxies in the early universe might be um, And Um, the, how active is this galaxy, right? Um, you know, is it, uh, it, is it super active? Um, and this should fall out from the 
from the imaging and then also the spectra. Um, so this is it. At lower redshifts, we see galaxies are less active on average. Um, then we go out to higher redshifts and they get more and more active. Um, this was a recent paper that had um, you know, estimates or uh, well, this is from, uh, from theoretical models, um, simulations of the universe. And, and they have the, uh, they've, they've laid it out really nicely where they just have the median um, and we can compare to these, to these predictions and see where we land on this. It's just one galaxy, you know, so you take that with a grain of salt and we live on a bunch of these galaxies. Um, but this one is relatively bright. We saw it with Hubble. Um, so we can really study it in a lot more detail. Um, you know, it, you, these are a dime a dozen now. You'll find redshift 11 galaxies, 12, 16, 20. Um, you know, we're not sure which ones are real yet. But, um, but this one will remain, this and the other one, they'll remain among the brightest that we can study in detail for some time to come. It's a, a long time. Um, and this is what we expect to get with near spec. Um, we're not getting out to, to oxygen three, but we, we see uh, you know a couple lines there um, that we can constrain the metallicity, star formation rate, that kind of thing. And to get to the highest uh, you know distances, the highest red shifts, um, we, I, I think we're going to need lensing. Um, it hasn't worn uh, out just yet, um, but, um, but but stay tuned for that. Um, so I just realized I have a number of other things here to show real quick uh, before we wrap up. Um, this, uh, all right, pop quiz. If, uh, so a reporter from the Washington Post uh, was, was talking to me and he said, I've heard that galaxies are too massive. And there was even some people that said, you know, that Lambda CDM is in trouble. They're all in cosmology. You, know, you can't possibly form these galaxies in the first 500 million years. Um, and so, so I said, well, um, I don't know, it's not really clear. And he asked like five different ways, but galaxies are too massive, right? Well, no, I think, um, you know, I, I sent him a link to a couple of these papers and I said, uh, well, um, so if they, um, if they have hotter dust, uh, you know, that, that could explain it. Or if there's an active uh, galactic nucleus, there's one explanation for it. Um, but, but basically th this was the, uh, <laughs> just to explain these plots real quick, it was, uh, it was a paper by Evo LeBay that came out early. Some of these galaxies are impossibly massive. Um, that they're, they're just the dark matter halos weren't even massive enough back then in the, in the formation of all of these structures in the early universe. Uh, and basically, that those are probably no, too high. Um, so there was, there was this paper that brought those masses down by an order of magnitude. Uh, I think things are probably okay, but. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up is because uh, you know maybe you all have, uh, have talked about this. Uh, I know uh, Michael Boyle and Coach Coach was at Boston. So, uh, yeah, you, might have, uh, you, know, you might have had more discussion of this, but uh, you know, I, my take of this is that they'll you know cosmology is probably okay. It doesn't have to be less massive, but uh, um, there's there's various explanations for this. And, um, yeah, we've only seen the tip of the iceberg with Hubble. Um, this is a slide from 20 years ago, and you know, spiral galaxies. You would only see these little clumps, just the hottest, you know, stars, um, you know, just the, the ones that burn bright in the ultraviolet. You know, stars like our sun and, and the distant universe were invisible to Hubble. They were just too red and redshift. Um, so we look with JWST, we're going to see all this fill out. We're going to get a full stellar census of these galaxies. And so people have started to see this in the distant universe. They've started to see this. We used to think galaxies were all you know, chaotic and had, they'd yet to form disks in the early universe. Well, there, there were some claims that, uh, you know, that you've seen uh, galaxies um, out to Richard Forrest. So. Um, and so there was a paper came out with a cute title, Panic at the Disks. Um, use the exclamation point here. Um, I'm using a question mark because uh, you know, we're, we're not sure. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about this. Um, and you know, there's, I mean, there's, you know, beautiful galaxies here. You see Hubble compared to JBST, um, they, they count the number of disks and it's where we're with Hubble, it just, you know, dropped like a rock and you just didn't see any in high redshifts. Now all of a sudden they're being revealed with JBST. I, I, I want to believe this. I think, you know, something like this will, um, you know, will turn out to be true. And maybe even this paper got it right. Um, but I think there's, there's still uncertainties there. Um, you know, as to, uh, I mean, these look convincing, but there's some of the other ones that, you know, it's not clear whether they're disks or whether they're even at that dimension. Um, but, uh, 
yeah, I think um, this is the type of thing we're, we're learning about. Um, yeah, uh, Justin and I were just talking about these, uh, these type of galaxies have been seen. He's been seeing them for 30 years, but you know, some of us are, are just well, it's a community, you know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but some people have been seeing these kind of things with with Alma, or um, Alma hasn't been long, around that long either. But um, other galaxies and uh, other observatories, you know, millimeter wavelengths, radio, um, and now we're seeing them with JPST. Um, so these are galaxies; they don't show up at all in, in Hubble, and then they're there with uh, with JWST. Erica Nelson had a great analysis of a bunch of these, um, and she she finds that they're they're flat. Um, they're flatter than you would expect for randomly oriented things. Um, so she says, you know, those are kind of disky. Um, you know, again, we don't expect to see disks like this in the early universe. Um, you know, and I think you know, if you talk to people who do simulations, they say, well, it's you know, be careful about what you call a disk. It might just be you know something. Roundish, and you can do a certain orientation or something. Um, so, but yeah, you know, regardless, they're um, you know, they're an interesting population of galaxies. And uh, you know, Justin was explaining to me that Alma has seen these type of things before, and those are probably the extreme end of uh, you know star forming, really dusty galaxies, sub millimeter galaxies. Um, and and these are you know, probably not quite as intense, um, but still you know really dusty um, you know population that we can never see before. And so we're starting to fill things out, I guess. You got the Alma really intense ones, and these, uh, you know. So way more common. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and you see a few of these uh, in each image. So we saw a few of these in our in our image. There's two that just, they're not there at all in Hubble. And they just pop out with GWST. Um, so, uh, yeah. And, oh, yeah, okay. So uh, one of the uh, note of caution is that we're still calibrating the telescope. Um, this is a lot of work being done at Space Telescope Science Institute, but also the community is, is doing this work. Um, you know, it's a big job, and uh, you know, people are uh, eager to do it, and they're, they're kind of you know making their own estimates of it. Um, Gabe Brammer uh, had an estimate that that he put out there, and then Martha Boyer uh, came out with their estimate from her ERS program. Um, got similar results uh, to the point where I now trust you know Gabe's recalibration and. Um, yeah, he's, um, he's processed every uh, image he can get his hands on. Um, so a lot of public data. I mean, this has been a real service to the community. Um, he's, a lot of the early papers have used his data products. Um, so uh, just uh, another shout out for, uh, for public data. Um, I think it's, it's been great. A lot of the data has been public. Um, and for the work that you know, Gabe and other people have been doing, uh, processing the data and putting it out there. So all of these programs are available uh, for people to analyze get the images and also the, the catalogs, redshifts, galaxy properties. It's all there. And then the, ours is one. I made my data public. Um, you can find it all at that website. And this is version four now with the new near cam uh, zero point set. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still early days with that. Um, and yeah, there's there's a lot more to come. Um, you know, again, we're observing blank and, and lens fields. Um, and here's a bunch of the other lens fields that are coming um, with JVST. Um, let's see. I'm also a member of Pearls, and we've observed, uh, where is it? We've, yeah, we've observed El Gordo. Uh, Naxo 416 is coming up, uh, I think, you know, later this week. Um, there's, uh, yeah, there's ERS programs uh, observing this one. Some of, a lot of this is going to be public. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of galaxy clusters being observed. I didn't include templates. Uh, templates is also being observed. Actually, they, some of those are on here. Yeah, there's there's templates. These, uh, these <laughs> galaxies, and you have data on these. Uh, Plus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great yeah, I, great I, did, I did my homework. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, the our uh, six Sunrise Arc is over here with Arendale. Um, I also uh, took these and I put them all on the same scale on the sky, um, just to, to give you an idea of how, how large they are. The Sunrise Arc is 15 arc seconds across. There's a lot of detail you can see. I named it after the sunburst arc, uh, which is you know even even larger at redshift two, um, and then yeah, then you get down to redshift eleven and really small things. Um, yeah, you can look at these. These go from the IMU. Why Jane picked those? Jane picked these for her program. Um, and uh, yeah, just as my kid at the beach, and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll make, uh, you know I have one or two more slides. But I'll pretty much end on this is that, uh, yeah, this is basically how I felt 
um, you know, all these years, um, you know, this old quote from Isaac Newton, um, you know, basically saying all these Hubble programs have kind of led up to this. And at least for me, uh, you know, relics, I was, you know, the, the, the idea was to look at a bunch of galaxy clusters and find things that were lensed brightly enough to study in detail of JVST. And so now here we are, we have JVST. And we're, we're just learning so much detail about the, the early universe. Um, and it's, it, it's super exciting. And I'm just you know, happy to be a part of it. And um, you're, you know, you can all be part of it too. There's, there's so much to do there. Um, and oh yeah, there's Jesus too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm you know, super grateful for 20,000 people. Jane Rigby counted them. There are a lot of people who uh, you know, worked on JWST. And uh, you know, I'm just, uh, yeah, just so grateful. It's been a team effort. Uh, it, you know, it's bigger than all of us. And uh, yeah, that's why we're, it's one of the reasons I'm just kind of putting stuff out there and saying, you know, let's, let's all work on it together. And yeah, I'll, I'll lead up uh, you know, the, the conclusions there, or uh, well, not really conclusions, but uh, just some things we talked about. And um, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, why don't I go back to that? Um, well, uh, the answer is no. So that it could be a short, uh, I mean, there's, there's people who, who know more about this kind of thing and uh, might have, have better uh, better ideas, maybe even people here, but at least in this case, um, they were very similar. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I mean, so you can, you can get more uh, photometry, right? You can, you can get more filters and, and you know, try to, try to pull that out. Um, you get spectra. Dan? When I look at these, I mean, there, there aren't really intense lines, you know, in either case, um, but, but maybe they'd be there. Yeah, maybe Casey was going to answer yeah. the question. No, I, I was going to talk to you about this later on. Um, the, the This is the SMAX cluster, right? Right, right. D don't you have MIRI imaging? Yeah. Is it deep yeah. enough to detect the seven micron emission, eight micron emission? That would probably break that degeneracy. Okay. Well, right. that'll do it. All right. Why don't you come on? So that would be off to the So basically, right, like for the dusty solution, that dust heats up and then that emission has to come out somewhere. I mean, that'd be like rest frame one micron, but I think that would be a useful, I think. What, what's the redshift to this galaxy? Oh, this is like redshift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mary should totally work. So the problem is, um, and it may be right, but so uh, the, so there's also nearest. Um, and so there was an idea, well, why don't we flip the spectra if you put these clumps? So what you see uh, when you look with nearest, uh, at least what I'm told, you see the body of the galaxy growing in that two side three. Um, but the clumps, you say, well, what about the clumps? That's what we're interested in. I say, well, you can't quite see the clumps in them. Um, they're they're fainter, and they're also that with the the grism observation, all of the light is spread across itself, and so it's, it's hard to disentangle. Um, so maybe that means that O3 isn't there, right? And it's it's really just in the body of the galaxy, and these these clumps don't have it, so that they're older. Um, or it means that you just can't see it. So I would imagine that with Miri, you'd run into the same thing. You're, you're interested in these little clumps that you're. I don't know. I think it was hard enough doing the photometry. They're, they're still working on it. Um, and even for the Sunrise Arc, we had 10 different people do it. And we got them to converge. Um, I got them. Um, so, uh, yeah, do you think, would it still work, Casey? Or? It's a good question. Um, I think the PSF or PSF at eight microns is about a quarter of an arc second full with F max. So maybe some of the brighter ones you would detect. I, we should look. So. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, I, that, yeah. Join our teleconference. I have you on it. Yeah. Well, that right. So yeah. Um, yeah. You this the, is so hard, Greg. Right? Yeah. So yeah, that's you know, so, yeah, maybe somebody could propose for director's time to do it, <laughs> or for cycle two. Um, if, you, if you put an IFU on it, you you see lines. I mean, I don't think I have, I know galaxies well enough. So, I mean, you know, this is there's really no lines. Just be degenerate and never know.
I guess, you know, you can see this is a little bit different here. But it's a really good question. Um, I know I kind of left that hanging because I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So I didn't assume you would just be like, yes, right, 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 right. Yeah. Another excellent question. Another, I don't know. I mean, I will say that, um, yeah, so the, I, I think you're talking about the ones a little higher redshift that I was showing before that. Uh, um, so this is a paper by Brian Angeli, Dan Stark et al. Um, and yeah, they, I, I actually last night as I was cramming for this test here, I, uh, I read their, uh, that paragraph in their paper where they say, um, and I actually, yeah, I, I made these uh, plots last night, and, uh, you know, and they said that um, they used a, they assumed a constant star formation history. And were these the ones you're talking about? So the, yeah, and they, Argued that that was that was okay, uh, and it's uh, better than uh, well, let's see, better than or different. Well, anyways, they, they argue that it's better than assuming a, what we call a non-parametric star formation history, which it's, it's one, you know, it's, it's still constant, but it's constant, you know, at one time at this value, and then at some other time it could be that value. Um, that uh, that that would uh, lead to higher masses. Um, that basically, um, that the way they do it, it could be a really short burst. Uh, but if you assume it's you know during this time what is it then it's you know that time for all of that amount of time it would make the mass higher basically. Um, now and, and there's there's a bunch of papers that have looked into this more detail that. Uh, and on this topic, can I ask a question, a related question? Yeah, I was gonna I was just gonna throw it to you and see if you knew the answer. Okay. I'm actually curious if you've looked or if anybody you know any, even you're tied into these things. I, I feel like some of the ones like the one in the upper right look a lot like what Ivo LeBay was arguing in his paper, right. double V right. things. Um, has anyone looked to yeah. see if they, if they the same object? Uh, you know, do they get the same answer? Do they not? I'm just, I'm very curious. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think I uh, had enough slides, but if I <laughs> were to have added another one and I, I thought maybe I had it in here, but so uh, yeah, I think Brian, was in the same paper, they, uh, they looked at that galaxy because it's from Sears and they, uh, they decided that, um, yeah, that they could fit it with um, either a supermassive thing or it could be younger with emission lines, kind of like this, just as you're saying, or it could have that galaxy, but with the ADN actually get the best fit. Um, and so they're like, well, you know, we're not gonna claim we've definitely seen a ADN at Redshift uh, 10 or 11, but you know, it does get a good fit. Um, but, well, but yeah, that, that's, a counter argument might be what's more likely uh, an AGN at redshift of seven or a extremely old galaxy at redshift seven, right? Right, right. I think it's yeah. worth exploring that. Um, plus, the fact that those emission lines are so strong, you showed a couple plots where the predicted emission line could put them with more like a thousand angstroms. Yeah, that one has it. It's three, is that in the rest frame? So, 3200 angstroms in the rest frame? I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Why would you know? <laughs> okay. But, um, right. I mean, but uh, I think yeah, we just don't know what's going on. Like in the gallery. Yeah. Like this one. That's the one you showed. I mean, that was striking. It is right. plot. I think that's yeah. also West Frame. I think that's the only plot there. But... Yeah. Yeah. Either way, like the photometry um, from the model, which I think is a little square on top of the data point at 4.4 .4 microns, <laughs> just shows that it's way off the chart. And so then it's really hard right. to know what's going on um, in terms of the stellar population because you're just dominated by the nebular spectrum. Yeah. And, and I can mention that this is with the BCO3 templates, the sort of standard ones. If I use B paths, uh, maybe I could get these to agree a bit better. Um, so that would include binaries and allow for a more intense emission. Um, no, it's well, cool. Yeah. yeah, super exciting. I mean, the um, strength of the emission lines shows you ought to pick that up really easily in near spec. So, yeah, yeah, and, um, and it also gives a hint what you expect out with Miri. Um, that was that was one. I mean, yeah, it's, it's good that you mentioned Miri. I mean, um, that was I originally had Miri in my proposal, um, and then I said, well, I'm going to wait um, because there's you know you'll see with the near infrared. <laughs> gotta gotta save something for cycle two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but uh, anyway, I I digress. Well,
I am around the rest of the day for lunch and dinner and everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.